right, here we go. Welcome to the show, podcast world. I'm your host. My friends call me Rasta Jeff. This is episode 755 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk about integrated pest management. Before I get to that part of the show, let's do a few shout outs to a few of those great folks who continue to support the show on Patreon. Let's kick it off with a big Grow From Your Heart podcast thank you shout out to my friend Quasi. Let's send a big thank you shout out to Spherical Glassworks. Let's send a fist bump and a thank you shout out to G7. I want to send a big thank you shout out to one of my favorite testers, my buddy Levity Loveday. Let's send a big thank you shout out to Kess Burton. Let's send a thank you shout out to the hardest working man in cannabis, my buddy James Brown. Let's send a big thank you shout out to Turt Burglar. I want to send a thank you shout out to Fruggle Rock. Let's send a big thank you shout out to Indica Chris. Let's send a big fist bump to Brohan78. Then let's wrap it all up with a big Grow From Your Heart podcast thank you shout out to Stoner Dave. Big thanks and big shout out to everybody who continues to support the show on Patreon. If you are not already supporting the show and you would like to learn how to do so, all you have to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash grow from your heart. All of the information you need will be right there on the screen. And you know I do include that link in the show notes and in the video description to make it super easy for all of my friends to support the show on Patreon. Before we get too far, let me remind you that we are approaching the 4th of July. Here in my neighborhood, we play a game which I like to call gunshots or fireworks. Quite often, we hear some bangs, some booms, some pops. And at this time of year, you just wonder, was that gunshots or fireworks? And you place your bets. Oftentimes, you never find out who's the winner or not. My point is, if you hear some bangs, some pops, some booms, play along. Try to decide with me. Were those gunshots or fireworks? You never know around here. Now is the time when I do want to invite you to the Dude Grows Growers Cup. That's right. The DGC Growers Cup is coming to Fort Collins July 30th from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And somewhere right outside of Fort Collins, I do look forward to seeing you, your crew, your smoke buddies at the DGC Growers Cup. Join Team Irie Genetics. Join a bunch of other great breeders. Join the Irie Army, the DGC crew at the DGC Growers Cup July 30th, just outside of Fort Collins. For all of the info, all of the links, all of the details, all the tickets you may need will be at dudegrows.com. Go check them out. Let them know that Rasta Jeff sent you. I do look forward to seeing you at the Dude Grows Growers cup event i will be there with a bunch of great beans available come say hi come take a selfie come give me a fist bump come chat come hang out it will be a long day i may be busy sometimes but if there's a break come shake my hand come give me a fist bump come introduce yourself come share some of your fine flowers i would love to see what you're doing all right let's move on i do have a lot to talk about in this podcast i've got an email here in front of me which I get very often. I don't answer this question enough because this is a big podcast. So I did put this one together for you. The question is very simple. It says, I have a spider mite problem. I could read you a lot more of the email, but I think that gets us right to the point. Let's jump into something that is very important for any cannabis grower of any level. If you're brand new at growing, if you're experienced at growing, if you're somewhere in between there, integrated pest management is something that should be on your radar, on your mind, in your standard operating procedures. That should be part of your method, uh, part of the method to your madness. We are going to get invaded by bugs at some point. You may have not gotten bugs at this point. I'm going to knock on wood for you and hope that you don't get them, but the chances are someday you're going to get bugs. And I would like you to be prepared, understand how to eradicate them, also understand how to prevent them. So let's get into an integrated pest management podcast. Uh, The main question is about spider mites, but with any pest, any bug, um, almost most problems in life, I like to say, set yourself up for success. When it comes to bugs, spider mites, thrips, fungus gnats, almost any pest we can think of, prevention is key. If we can prevent them from getting in there, have some sort of security system in place, a standard operating procedure, that will make things a lot easier. So if you're not already doing some sort of preventative program to make sure the bugs don't come, now may be a good time to start thinking about it. Think about it this way. When shit goes down, would you rather have security guards there waiting to break up the rumble, the mite battle, the mite orgy? Because that's what's going to happen. It's going to be a mite picnic and then a mite orgy. Do you want security guards there already? Those security guards could be either a spray application or those security guards could be other beneficial insects. But would you rather have security on standby or would you have to rather have to call the cops and wait for them to show up, which could be 
for you to spot the problem and then start applying a pesticide or maybe even to have to order the predator bugs from an insectary, wait for them to come, distribute them, wait for them to develop population and start eradicating your bugs. Prevention is key. I would rather have security on hand. I don't want to have to wait for those bugs or sprays to arrive. So prevention is key. What are you doing in your room to make sure that no bugs get into your room? There are a lot of things you can do if you've got uh, cracks in the walls, seal those cracks up with some caulk. If you've got a window or something where things can get in, get some tape over that, get some sort of sealer. Think of all the ins and outs in your grow space and seal all of that stuff up. Keep in mind, it gets cold outside. It gets hot outside. In your grow room, that's the most perfect environment for most of the bugs that we're going to face. That's why they thrive so well in our grow room. We're providing the perfect temperature, the perfect VPD. We give water at a very specific interval, and the bugs love that rhythm. If the plants are happy, the bugs are probably happy as well. So it's outside. The bugs can feel and sense that there's warmth in that other room. They can smell those great terps in that other room, and they're like, hey, guys, it's cold and shitty. We're out here living in a fucking rose bush. Let's go party in there where the weed plants are, and all the spider mites just find one little crack in the wall, one little gap in the window. They congregate into your weed plants where it's fucking beautiful. It's Jamaica in there all day long. You got it at just the right temp, just the right VPD. They go make a little hammock up on one of your plants. They start eating. Then they start breeding. Then they take over. So they know that it's there. Let's prevent them from coming in. Let's think about ways that these bugs get into our grows. A lot of times, like I just mentioned, they come in through the cracks in the walls. Sometimes they're already there. Many of these bugs are very common. If there are plants around, they're already there. But how do they get into the grow if they're not already in the space? A lot of times they will come in your soil. Many people blame a specific brand of soil or soilless mix for having bugs in it. Every brand can have bugs in it. I don't care if it's Ocean Forest. I don't care if it's Pro Mix. I don't care if it's Roots Organics. All of those bags of dirt have the potential to have bugs in them. I've gotten bugs in every bag of dirt, every brand. There's been no brand that has been bug free. Let's talk about this. People claim I bought Ocean Forest and got bugs in it. I bought Roots 707 and got bugs in it. I bought the other brand. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Yes, of course, there's bugs in there. It's fucking soil. It's soilless mix. It's dirt. It's very desirable for bugs. Also, it is made, stored, and kept in a place where those bugs are very readily available. You can't blame any specific brand for giving you bugs. All of the bags of soil are kept in a, most of them are made very near each other. Then they're sent to a warehouse. They're all kept in a warehouse together. Do you think the bugs go, hey, let's just go into this one bag. Let's just, the bugs are not brand loyal is what I'm trying to say. They don't care about, they can't see the cool coloring on the roots or on the Fox Farms bag. They don't know those fish are even printed there. Those bugs go wherever they can go to find a party, to get some warmth, to get some food. They want to eat and they want to breed just like you. They're going to go into every bag that's available. You just bought a bag that had bugs in it and it happened to be whichever brand you chose. So if you've gotten a bag of soil that had bugs in it, it wasn't the maker of that soil's fault. That soil went to a warehouse. It stayed in a warehouse, possibly outdoors. There's a very popular uh, grow supply center in Colorado Springs. They keep all of their soil outdoors. If there's there are bugs in one bag, they're going in every bag. They're going to overload that one bag, all the food, all the hiding places. The hotel will be booked. They're going to go somewhere else, which is the next bag over. It may be a different brand. It may be the same brand. All the brands are going to get bugs. They get transferred in the same trucks. The Roots Organics, the Fox Farms, the Tuper, the fucking everything. It came on the same truck. Why wouldn't the bugs travel from bag to bag? So don't blame any specific brand for getting bugs into your grow. That is your responsibility as the farmer, as the lead grower, as the head cultivator, as the head motherfucker in charge. It is your responsibility to make sure that bugs don't make it into your grow. Inspect the soil. Treat it with the pesticide. Treat it with the... Uh, uh, Treat it with a predator bug if that's what you've got to do, but be preventative, inspect your soil. It is your job to make sure that doesn't get in there. Treat everything like there is bugs. There are bugs on everything that comes in. There's bugs in the soil. Let's talk about the next way they come in. They come in on plants. Are you bringing in clones? Are you getting cuttings from a friend? That is a great way to bring in bugs. All of your friends are going to say, dude, my grow is clean. I don't have anything. The person that claims to have the cleanest grow is usually the person with the worst bugs. They just haven't found them yet. So when you get a clone or a plant or a cutting from a friend, make sure it is treated. That's the best way to bring unwanted bugs into your grow room. All right, here's a side note that I'm going to totally derail my train of thought 
and try to throw this in. It's not on my notes, but I just thought about this. We build very nice grow rooms indoors. We put really good lights in there. We put ducting in there. Uh, we clean everything up. Hopefully, hopefully you're cleaning your grow space. Clean that shit up, dude. I'm talking to myself too. Uh, we build these really nice controlled environments. I do not find it wise. I would not recommend to move our ganja plants that we have in our indoor area outdoors for sunshine during the day and then back inside. I would not recommend that. If that is something you choose to do, if that's your main strategy, that's cool. But if that is your main grow space where you mainly intend to have the plants indoors, I wouldn't contaminate it with the outdoor plants. The minute you put those plants outdoors, they're going to get tra trespassers. They're going to get stowaways. You're going to bring them into your grow space. They're going to find places to hide in there. It's Jamaica, like we talked about earlier. It's perfect environment in there. Some of the bugs might hop off that plant and stay in the room the next time you carry that plant outside. So now you've kind of contaminated that indoor grow with outdoor bugs. You just brought the bugs in. The reason we really built that room was to isolate everything and keep that plant safe from all of those outdoor bugs. We've got a perfect room in there. So I don't recommend moving your plants from indoors to outdoors. That is not, and then back in. That's not something I would recommend. Have indoor plants or have outdoor plants. I understand you're gonna do light depth and some shit like that is gonna happen, but my general recommendation is if you've built a nice indoor grow room, have a nice indoor grow room that you've never contaminated with those outdoor plants. What I was getting to before that I wanna get back on track is, when you get new plants, new clones from a friend, make sure you isolate those plants. Don't take those right into general population. You can put, if you get a clone, a small plant, you can put it in the windowsill for a couple of days, take it out of the window, treat it with whatever pesticide you choose to use. Something, I use something strong. When shit comes in, if I get a cut from anybody, if it was from one of my best friends, if it was from my mama, if it was from my girlfriend or a complete stranger, I'm going to treat that clone the same. It's contaminated. In my mind, it is contaminated. It's got mites, thrips, spider, uh, fungus gnats, powdery mildew. It's got herpes. It's got all the shit you could imagine. I'm going to treat it and keep it away from my plants for seven to 10 days until I'm sure that that plant is clear. Then it gets to go into general population. I cannot risk bringing shit in and destroying a grow. I got spider mites from a very reputable grower and they were the most ferocious fucking spider mites I've ever seen. They did some damage, slowed me down. We recovered. However, they did fuck me up. I learned my lesson there. I talk about mistakes I've made. Trusting a very reputable, popular grower fucked me over. I got a clone that was riddled with mites. I brought it right in. And before I noticed, we we're fucked. All right. We're talking about how bugs come in. Bugs come in on uh, you have the soil. They make it in in the soil. Bugs come in in other plants. Bugs also come in on you, your clothing, your shoes, your dreadlocks. Yes, I'm holding up my own dreadlocks. I'm guilty. I'm talking about it myself. I've, my dreads go to my calves, you guys. I don't know if you've seen recent pictures I posted on the gram. My dreadlocks, I'm six foot five. I'm six foot five tall, and my dreadlocks touch my calves. I got quite a bit of hair. I do have a dedicated grow area hat. I keep the dreads tied up. I uh, try to keep the, I just try to mitigate problems there. But you do bring, you travel the bugs around through your shoes, your pants, your shirt, your dreadlocks, your long hair, whatever you may be wearing. That's a great way to move bugs around. Also, we've talked about it before. The dog will bring bugs into your grow room. I don't prefer to have the dog in there. That's man's best friend, but be my best friend upstairs. We'll hang out in the backyard, stay out of my grow space. So the bugs make it in in a variety of ways. It is our responsibility to minimize those ways for those bugs to get in. It's your responsibility, like I said, is the, we're farmers. We are growing an agricultural product. We've got to keep a farmer's mindset in mind, and that means we're battling pests and insects at all times. Unfortunately, some of the pests that we are battling are nearly or are actually microscopic, so we can't even see them. So we've got to pay attention to the plants. We've got to keep a good eye on the garden and see what that garden is telling us and be ready to react as soon as we see a problem based on an insect. Now, the reaction part is where people really mess up. They see a small problem and they want to do something freaking crazy to solve that problem, and they overkill the small problem and cause a bigger, bigger problem by panic mode. I talk about panic mode, grower panic mode. You see that little issue and you've got your plants are at risk and now you just fuck everything up because you went into panic mode and didn't think things through. Think about what you're going to do when you get those pests. Start thinking now, how nuclear do I want to go? How gentle do I want to go? How abrasive or toxic do I want to be with the pesticides which I choose to use? That is up to you. I will make recommendations. I'll give you product names, but 
I do not judge you uh, based on the pesticides you choose to use in your garden. I do judge you if you use a product too late in the fl on the flowering stage or in flowering stage, and there are residual chemicals left behind that can cause harm to a consumer. I will judge you for that. If you use a pesticide correctly and properly at the right interval, duration, dilution, application rate, you're safe about it. I will not judge you for any product you choose to use if you're doing it safely and correctly. That's what the products are for. That's what we're, we've got a goal. We've got a product to protect. I understand, but it is your, uh, your prerogative, how toxic, how gentle, how, what, what products you want to use. Some things are pretty fucking rough. Some things are really fluffy and gentle. People want to stick to the word organic. I always say, remember that cyanide is organic and just a couple of drops of that will kill you. So don't let the word organic be too much of a buzzword when it comes to pest eradication. Just because a product is organic doesn't mean that it is safer, less harmful to a human body, less harmful to the environment than a product that doesn't have an organic stamp on it. Also, with that same thing being said, an organic product does not have to be considered less effective than a non-organic product. For the right situation, that organic product may wipe out your fucking problem. On the same, in the same battlefield, in a different situation, that non-organic product may be exactly what you need. It's all about situation. It's all about understanding. It's all about the pest you're trying to attack. A lot of it is based on the phase of growth which these plants are in. I want to get back to where I was. It is up to you to decide the level of abrasiveness, toxicity, how powerful, how potent you want to go with your pesticides. Do your research on the products you are thinking about using. Read the MSDS sheet. See what's in there. Read the active ingredient. Read uh, is it toxic? Is it poisonous? What does it do to the environment? Read about that product. Do you want to spray that on flowers that you're going to consume? If you're the only one consuming it, spray whatever the fuck you feel you're safe with doing. If you're going to give it to other people, keep them in mind. Spray something that is safer. Maybe stick with something with a shorter half-life. Something. Um, let's talk about half-life. Somebody asked me about this in an Instagram live feed lately recently. Half-life. When I spray a product... Over a certain duration, it is going to break down 50%, and that product will not be available on the plants anymore. It, uh, I don't know the exact science. It biodegrades. It breaks down. It disappears. Uh, the sun breaks it down. The wind breaks it down. The rain breaks it down. The, the availability of that product on the plants uh, dilutes, dissipates. Again, I'm not completely qualified to teach this, but I'll teach you the way that I know it. When you spray that product on there, it's 100%. Over a certain amount of time, it breaks down to 50%. Then over at that time again, it breaks down to 25%. Then over time, you get 12.5%. Then over time again, you get 6.25%. Then eventually you're down to 3.12%. Keeps breaking half-life. Understand the half-life of the product you are using. Also, understand the re-entry interval of the product you are using. That is, when you apply a product in a grow space, how long do you have to wait to safely enter that grow space again? Now, I want to group these two things together. Take your half-life and your re-entry interval, and if you're growing indoors, increase those drastically because in an outdoor environment, we've got the sun. The sun will break down those chemicals, those products, those agents, the ingredients in the pesticide spray, and they won't last as long on the plant. They will disappear. They'll be gone basically in a shorter amount of time because like I said earlier, the wind, the sun, the rain, those things get rid of those products. Indoors, we've got caustic grow lights that are nowhere near as powerful as the sun. They're not breaking the chemicals down as quickly, so they will be there longer. We don't have the same ventilation indoors, so you're Half-life and your re-entry interval basically need to be doubled indoors. Some people aren't going to follow that. Some people think I'm crazy. As somebody who is trained by the Colorado Department of Agriculture, it's my responsibility to make sure I say it. What you do with that info is up to you. You're a grown-ass fucking adult. Have fun. Do your thing, pimpin'. All right, the next thing I want to talk about, I'm going out of order on my notes here, but I feel like this is very important. Um, protective personal equipment, PPE, personal protective equipment. I don't know what order I said it in the first time, but protect your protect yourself with the proper personal protective equipment. You guys, when you buy a pesticide, there's a little booklet on the side of the bottle. That's not a story about the guy that made the pesticide. That's not a comic book. That is actually the instructions and a bunch of tips about that product. It will tell you if that product is 
If you can drink it, it'll tell you if it's dangerous. It'll tell you if it's toxic. It'll tell you if it'll fucking kill you. It will tell you the personal protective equipment that is recommended for that product. Most of the time, they're going to want you to wear six millimeter or thick. Is it millimeter or milliliter? Millimeters. These are solids. Milliliters are liquids. You want six millimeter or thicker nitrile gloves. Most pesticides are going to ask you to wear long sleeves. We don't want you to get any pesticide on your skin. Most of the time, pants cover your feet with shoes. A lot of the time, they're going to want a mask, some sort of a respirator. Every time we want some sort of eye protection, what you do from there will be probably pesticide uh, specific, but I recommend putting on the personal protective equipment before you get the pesticides. What if, and I don't know where you work, I don't know where you grow, but what if the person that managed that pesticide before you didn't put the lid on it all the way and you just naturally grab it and the next move to do with the pesticide is to give it a shake, then measure some out. What if you're just moving, doing your thing? You got Joe Rogan in your ear. Maybe I'm in your ear jamming the podcast. You grab that bottle. You give it a shake. If you or the person before you didn't put that lid on all the way, pesticide is now flying out of that bottle. If that pesticide gets in your eye, you could be fucked. You could be really fucked. You could have some big problems. It's going to burn. It's going to suck, but you could have long-term damage. Let's have our personal protective equipment on before we even touch the pesticides. It sounds like overkill which is what I want. I want overkill. I want you to be safe. I don't want you to get sick. I don't need you contaminated. I want you to live through this. We're growing cannabis. Let's not get fucking hurt growing cannabis. You want to smoke some herb and chill out, not end up in the fucking hospital. So personal protective equipment is very important. Let me get back on track here and keep my notes here. Um, the products you decide are up to you. The applications you decide to use are up to you. Many people will choose to use predator insects. If that's what you choose to do, that is up to you. It's all up to what you want to do in your grow. That's one of the best parts about growing weed. You get to decide what you want to do. One important thing though is monitoring that grow and keeping an eye out for bugs. How are you going to know if bugs there are there? Are you scouting personally? Do you have a crew scouting? Occasionally, do you walk in and just blindly grab at a leaf? Occasionally, I don't even know what plant I just touched. I know I just go right there and I took a leaf and I'm going to inspect this leaf very carefully. I'm going to look at the top of it. I can tell a lot by the top. Uh, no powdery mildew. It doesn't look like any chew marks. No thrip shit. Looks good. Flip it over. Do I see any spider mites? Do I see any fungus gnats? Do I see any white flies? If that leaf is cool, I'm probably pretty good. I won't pull another one. I don't need to. I've seen all the info I need. But I will go in there sometimes twice a day in my personal grow and just give it a good scouting. How does shit look? Are there any bugs? One thing I want to talk about is yellow sticky traps and the blue sticky traps. Those little cards you guys like to use. I love them. I highly recommend them. Those are great products. However, those are not any way to eradicate or remove a bug. What those are there for is to show you that there is a presence of a pest. They do not do anything to get rid of a bug. A bug has to land on that fucking yellow card for it to do anything. How many of the bugs do you think, oh, look, a yellow card, let's jump right onto it. Most of them don't do that. Those are there to show you some of the bugs that are in here were stupid enough to fly onto the yellow card. There are probably a lot more and you should think about it. A lot of them come with like a grid. They've got squares printed on there. That's so that during the morning, you can count, basically get a good visual count, how many bugs per square. There are two bugs per square. There are five bugs per square. There are 20 per square. We're really stepping our shit up. Check again at lunch. See how many there are. See over the day how many bugs progress. Do you need to do something about it or is it an acceptable amount of bugs? What's cool with you? A few fungus gnats in a big grow, that's fine. A bunch of fungus gnats in a small grow, fuck that. We got to do something. It's up to you. But those yellow sticky traps are not any source of eradication. They are alerting. They're notification. It's not doing anything but telling you there are bugs here. Now let's talk a little bit about things we can do to get rid of and prevent pests in our grow. Of course, the first, some of the first things we can do come with standard, standard operating procedures. I guess the first thing is building a proper room. Seal that room up. Are all the gaps from outside sealed or all the gaps from the other room sealed? Are you clean when you're going in? Do you have a standard operating procedure? Do you have grow room clothes? Do you have grow room shoes? Do you have grow room a grow room hat for your dreadlocks? Are you stepping on one of those mats that's got the cleaner in it to clean up your shoes? Do you put on booties? Do you wear a, a scrub jacket to go in there or a, a, a lab coat or scrubs to go in there? What are you doing to prevent the bugs? The next thing we can do is I think defoliation is a great way to minimize all of the problems in the grow. If we defoliate, I basically describe the leaves as like 
hotels and hammocks for the plants. It's where the plants are chilling. That's houses and hotels. They're on the leaves. They're not chilling out on the stalks, mostly, maybe if you got a lot, but they're on the leaves. If there aren't too many leaves, there aren't too many places for bugs. Also, that's less opportunity for powdery mildew. Get that shit out of there. You don't need all those leaves. That's going to lead to problems. People say that the leaves are the source of food and the solar panels for the plants. Dude, there are so many leaves in there. You could take some out. Don't worry. You don't have to worry about the food. We're feeding the fucking plants through the roots. We're giving them very expensive nutrients they're eating, and they're getting the best light that they can. Take off some of those leaves so that the light can get to the buds that you want to get big and fat. Defoliate. That will help you prevent bug problems. Also, turn up the fan. I think if you turn up some fans and have some airflow in there, the bugs don't want to be around as much. Also, one thing I will notice, though, if the bugs do, if the spider mites start getting out of control, they use those fans as like, um, it's kind of like a hang glider. They climb up to the top of the plant and they catch the wind off the fan and they drop a web and they blow from this plant right over to the next one. They use the fan to do it. So have the fan in there so that they can't colonize. They can't establish a presence. But once they do get present, you might want to slow down that fan to keep them from traveling around so much. Now, another thing we can do to prevent some bugs is to just make an undesirable environment for any bug that may show up, any pest that may come around. Let me give a quick disclaimer. 99% of what I'm going to tell you is going to be for an indoor grow. Outdoor growing is a whole new beast. We'll touch on that. Not very much. Now, I said create an undesirable environment for the bugs. I've said before that we're creating Jamaica in our grow space. We've got the perfect VPD. The temp is great. The humidity is great. Just enough wind to make it comfortable. We don't disrupt it. There's no predators in there unless you've introduced some. So let's make an environment that is undesirable for these bugs. Maybe occasionally you can just mist the plants with water. They don't like water. A lot of the bugs don't want to hang out if it's too humid. 90% of our bugs are going to be on the underside of the leaf. The top of the leaf, you don't have to spray it. They're going to be on the bottom. So come from the underside of the plant with your little mister, with your spray bottle, and just start at the bottom and work your way up under the plant. Lift up the leaves as you go and spray the underside. Make it undesirable. If you want to add a product, you can put in some sort of insecticidal soap, or you can step up your game and start actually using a pesticide as a preventative. There is no problem, and I highly recommend using a spray application of pesticides on a weekly basis to keep bugs at bay. So some of the first steps are to prep the room. The next step is to have a standard operating procedure so that you don't bring bugs in through the soil, through your plants, or through your clothes. Then we start creating an undesirable environment for the bugs. A little bit of defoliation, a little bit of wind, maybe some moisture on the leaves. Maybe I recommend start applying a foliar fed pest application, some sort of pesticide targeted for the bugs you know you are going to get in your area. I would recommend doing preventative sprays on a weekly basis, rotate your products. Then if you do see a pest problem start to arise, then increase the interval, the amount of sprays, increase the amount of spray that you put in the mix, then maybe start doing rotations of a stronger pesticide more frequently. Now, I do recommend a rotation of pesticides because these bugs will develop a resistance to pesticides. Think about if I walked in your grow space every day and tapped you on the shoulder and threw just a shitty left jab at you. By day three, you're going to block that left jab. You're going to go, here comes the jab, tap you on the shoulder. You're going to turn on your block will already be up. You'll be ready to block my left jab. No problem. If I came in there on day four, tapped you on the shoulder, threw a vicious right cross, you're not going to be ready for that shit. It's going to get you. We've got to do that to the spider mites also. They do learn. They do start to build up resistance. They are evolutionary creatures. They will say, oh, you sprayed evergreen on me three days in a row. Watch this. Day four, the bugs that live from the first three days of evergreen, they're going to lick their arm and they'll go, ah evergreen. And they're just going to look at you like they're fucking crazy. They're going to eat up the evergreen and get stronger from it. So I recommend a rotation of products. I will go through a list of products that I do recommend. Once again, nobody pays me. They're just shit that shit that I know that works. Let's talk about some of the pests that you will encounter in your indoor grow. Let me do that disclaimer. Once again, this is going to be mostly indoors. I'm an indoor grower. I do have a greenhouse couple of greenhouses. What did I say that? Got some greenhouses going, but most of this is indoor stuff. What bugs are we going to get indoors in our garden? Most commonly, we are going to see spider mites, the dreaded spider mites. Spider mites are scary. A lot of people think they're a huge deal. Uh, It's a fucked up situation, depending on the stage of growth which you are in, but spider mites are very easy to get rid of. 
if you are patient, have a strategy and understand what you are doing and you're not lazy about it. You cannot be lazy in the grow. The bugs will take over. If you get lazy, they'll start fucking challenging you. Um, basically you're going to see the two spotted mite. Um, the real problem is the russet mite. If you've got russet mites, that changes everything. Uh, I do uh, consulting. My consultation includes pest eradication in your grow. If you've got russet mites, I do charge you another level to get rid of those in a commercial grow. It's more expensive. It takes a lot more work. It's a lot more strategy, a lot more cooperation from the team. So we've got spider mites. Uh, another thing you may see are thrips. People get scared of thrips. People have a long, uh, it takes them a long time to identify that it's actually a thrip issue. Thrips are easy. We can definitely get rid of thrips. Aphids. You may see aphids in your grow. Aphids of all colors. Aphids have become like fucking Skittles. They're every color now through evolution and through uh, regional evolution, I guess it is. There are aphids of every fucking color. You'll see them. They're not a big deal. We can get rid of those as well. Uh, fungus gnats are very common in a grow environment. Those are very, very easy to get rid of. Not very problematic, but they can lead to other problems. They can be, uh, they, if you've got a small problem plus fungus gnats, those two together compound a problem very well. Another common issue is white flies. A lot of people will get white flies indoors and outdoors. Uh, those are very easy to eradicate. Another big issue that's not a bug per se, but does happen quite often is powdery mildew. Especially here in Colorado, we get huge temperature swings, temperature spikes. Uh, last year in the winter, we had negative 17 degree temperatures. Try keeping your grow room warm inside with the wall right here. And then on the other side of that wall, it's fucking negative 17 degrees. There's snow packed up against the walls and you're just trying to balance the shit out in the rooms. There's condensation raining from the fucking ceiling. It's very interesting at that time of year. We do get powdery mildew from that show. So be prepared. Um, let's talk about outdoor outdoors is totally different. You guys, I am not super experienced with the outdoor, but outdoor, uh, you may experience birds. Birds could be problematic. I've seen birds steal buds, just fly down and pinch little pieces of the weed off the weed plant all season long and just destroy plants. Uh, deer, deer will come and eat your whole fucking plant. I've seen bears come. I haven't seen them personally. I've seen instances where bears have come and stolen plants from the grow. Bunnies are notorious. If you got too many rabbits, they'll eat the shit out of your plants. Um, in Colorado, we get these caterpillars. We get moths that land in the plants. They lay eggs, and those turn into these orange caterpillars. Those things have fucking ruined so many crops of people that I know. So you're going to get a lot of outdoor bugs. One th oh, another thing we should think about outdoors is thieves. We get a lot of thieves, especially here in Colorado, especially here in Pueblo. People love to steal your outdoor weeds. So if you're going to plant outdoor weed, plant one for the crook, one for the bugs, one for the bunnies, and then maybe you'll get one for yourself also. I'm hoping you get the best. I'm being optimistic. Uh, I've done a full episode on bud washing. If you do grow outdoors, your outdoor weed may be very dirty. There may be some bugs in there. I've done an episode on bud washing. Maybe check out the bud washing episode. That may be a good episode for renting off your outdoor weed. A lot of people are, that's really controversial. I think it's a good show. Check that out. I digress. Let's get more into integrated pest management. We've talked about the bugs that we're going to face. We're going to face spider mites, thrips, aphids, fungus gnats, white flies, possibly powdery mildew. Um, there are other things that a lot of the grow books talk about that do pop up. Honestly, mealy bugs and scales and shit like that is very, very uncommon. I've been growing for a thousand years. It feels like I've never seen a mealy bug or a scale. So we're not going to worry too much about that. Let's talk about now uh, about options on how to get rid of these bugs. We've talked about ways to kind of prevent them. Let's talk about ways to get rid of them. I am a commercial ganja grower. I like to grow in large warehouses with large plants with a lot of toys. The way that I prefer in my method uh, to get rid of and prevent bugs is a rotation of pesticide applications and a spray method. Sprayed pesticide applications are my favorite. A lot of people out there don't agree with that. They don't want to smoke pesticides. They don't want to smoke chemicals, but everything is chemicals if you understand that. And I understand that you may not want to consume some pesticides, but we've got to do what we've got to do to keep the bugs away, to protect our investment, to make sure that you were delivered a product. And my job as the lead cultivator, the consultant, also somebody trained by the Colorado Department of Agriculture, it's my job, my responsibility, also somebody who is highly passionate about cannabis. I'm not just a grower. I'm not just a breeder. I love to smoke. The root of all of this, it all started because I love to smoke ganja. I'm a cannabis consumer. I'm going to smoke everything that we grow at my commercial facility. So I keep that in mind. I'm also very passionate about 
cannabis consumers and cannabis patients. I come from the medical marijuana side of cannabis is where I got started. I want to make sure not to get anybody sicker than they already are. I don't want to make anybody sick at all. The goal for my cannabis that I grow is for people to feel better, to have a better quality of life after they consume the product that I produced. So not only am I professionally and ethically uh, responsible, but I'm also personally and passionately invested in making sure that these products are safe. So one of my big jobs in the facility is to make sure that we are safely, ethically, and effectively using the correct products at the correct time to get rid of bugs, but also not contaminate any of the product to where it could be problematic for anybody who may consume the buds, the edibles, the concentrates, anything that comes out of my grow. I am responsible for that. My name is on that product. If you look at the jar where the herb came from, it will tell you the number where that product was produced here in Colorado. And if you know the numbers and you know the right facilities, you know who grew that shit. You could say this was a Rasta Jeff grow. You can find it and you can fucking call me out and blame me for whatever you need to blame me for. So I know I do talk a lot about the business side of commercially producing cannabis. It's a big investment. It's a lot of responsibility, but please never feel like I've forgotten about the patients, about the consumers, about the people that sparked this passion for uh, large scale cannabis production in me. I grow cannabis to make people feel better. I breed cannabis to make people feel better. That is the overall goal of this here. I have not lost sight of that goal. I am involved in a lot of things. I have gone very far from the original root of this project, but I know that the original, the, the whole mission, the intent is to make people feel better. And I know that giving you a pesticide on your product is not going to make you feel better. I want you to live longer, healthier, happier, and I can't do that if I poison you with the fucking pesticide. So one of my big things is to make sure that we are doing this ethically and responsibly. That is something I take good pride in. So I do talk about sprayed applications. A lot of people are not into the sprays. That is cool. Do your thing. How are you keeping the bugs away if you're not using a sprayed application? A lot of people will choose to use predator insects. They get other bugs that do not harm the plants, but they do eat the bugs that are there in the grow. So you can get things like lace wings, uh, Swarskis, Persimilis, Hypoaspis miles, uh, rove beetles, assassin beetles, things like that. And you buy them and they come in the mail and you release them in the grow. And those will go and act just like predators out in the wild. They'll eat all of your fucking spider mites, all of your fungus gnats. A lot of people do choose to use ladybugs. Let me talk about ladybugs briefly. I think they're lazy. They're cool if there's like bugs are right here. A ladybug may go over here and eat it. But if there's a bug over here and a ladybug over here, a ladybug's not going anywhere to fucking eat it. In my experience, you'll spend money on ladybugs. You'll release them into grow, into the grow. You'll take a bunch of pictures because they're gorgeous. You'll find a couple that are humping. There's always ladybugs humping. Uh, you'll find them up on the tops of the plants. You'll take a great, bunch of great photos and you'll turn off the lights and you'll go to your business and you come in the next day. Half the ladybugs will be dead. They flew into the fucking light. They flew into the fan. They flew into the blower. Ladybugs are pretty, but they are not the smartest fucking creature on the planet. They're suicidal. They're kamikaze. Uh, they don't last very long. They stink. Uh, they die. They land on the floor and they stink. In my opinion, that smell from the dead ladybugs is terrible. Then you got to sweep them all up uh, and it's kind of a waste of money. I would recommend a more aggressive, more effective predator. Uh, Californicus, Swarsky, that may be the same thing. They change the names on these bugs and I can't keep the Latin names all straight in my mind. I order them honestly and I can remember the names that I order. The Swarskis, the Cucamaris, uh, the Californicus, the Hypoaspis Miles, Green Lace Wings, Rove Beetles. Um, what's the other one that I said? Assassin Beetles. Um, those are all great predator beetles or predator bugs. But just like a pesticide, what I'm about to say applies to predator insects and pesticides. You've got to have the correct uh, eradication device for the correct problem. Uh, if you go releasing the wrong bug for the wrong bug, they may never meet up. But if you know what, you're, what bugs you're facing and you do the right research, you can find the correct bug to go in there and get that bug right away. The problem is, in my opinion, with the predator bugs is that you've got to build up populations. On the same hand, it does take time, effort, and energy to spray a pesticide, and that does do some stress to the plants. If you're letting out bugs, the plants barely know that those bugs are there, but it does take a little while for that army to get out there and start doing work. So you've got your toss up there, your 50-50. Let's talk about another way to get rid of bugs in our grow. Many people forget that a lot of the bugs we face are not on the leaves of the plant. They actually live 
down in the soil, the cocoa, the medium, that's where they go. You may see them pop up occasionally and show you that they're there, but they're living down in the soil. So a soil dredge is another very effective way to get rid of many of the bugs we face. Oftentimes, if we've got a bug, if it's thrips, spider mites, fungus gnats, white flies, a lot of the time, I, my first reaction is to defoliate. Let's just get rid of some of these leaves, clean up the bottoms, take off a bunch of leaves. That's going to help us out. That's the first step. Then the next step, let's do a soil dredge of the appropriate product. If I've got, uh, let's just say if I've got fungus gnats, I would use 15 to 30 milliliters of evergreen per gallon of water as a soil dredge. I would run that right through the pot, right through the soil until I get a little bit of runoff. That way I know that all that soil in there has now been poisoned. Any fungus gnats in there are gonna get poisoned. They're gonna die. They're not gonna wanna live in there. Now the next move, I would spray the plants with 15 to 30 milliliters per gallon of evergreen. It's down there in the soil. Let's get it up top also. That way we killed everything. If there are bugs on the leaves, they're going to run to the soil looking for refuge. Guess what? Poison down there. If there are bugs in the soil, they're going to run up to the leaves looking for refuge. Guess what? Poison up there. Let's get them. Let's get them on all levels. Let's not give them anywhere to hide. And one thing I want to talk about is fungus gnats. Those are there because you're overwatering. If you stop overwatering, the fungus gnats will stop coming around. So those should be easy to get rid of. Fungus gnats, quickly, how do you get rid of fungus gnats? Defoliate, um, do a soil dredge of either, uh, I would just say evergreen. Let's just start off right with evergreen. You could use Azitrol, Azamax, but I think evergreen or Pyganic, which is a very similar product, reduce the dosage of the Pyganic though. Um, give it a soil dredge, defoliate, soil dredge, foliar feed, repeat in three days, fungus gnats are gone, bro. If you do it right, the fungus gnats will be gone. Maybe repeat a third time. The plants are going to look a little bit stressed if you hit them with that much oil three times, but your fucking bugs will be gone. All right, where are we? Um, let's talk about what we can do. Things are really... All right, another thing we need to talk about is what phase of growth are our plants in? If we're in veg, we can do a lot of things to the plants. If you're just starting to flower, your options are slimming out. If you're in flower, your options for spray applications become very thin. Keep in mind that people are going to consume this. We don't want to put a product on here that is not going to, the half-life is not going to come up by the time we consume this product. So keep that in mind. You don't want to taste it. You don't want to smoke it. You definitely don't want it in your concentrates. Imagine if I sprayed something on your buds and you taste it in the buds. Imagine if I put those buds in an extraction device of any kind. We're concentrating the pesticide, that shitty flavor as well. Your dabs are going to taste 20 times worse than the flowers taste. So think about the stage of growth you are in and adjust your pesticide application accordingly. Something I like to do in a commercial grow, I just said we focus on spray applications. Yes, as soon as I see bud set, guess what I do? I release a fuck ton of predator bugs. So I've got sprays all the way up to about day 14, maybe day 20. Then by day 21, I've got an army, a bunch of boxes of predator bugs to release into the entire grow. So I switch it over to predators later in the season. So I start off my grow season with spray applications. Once I get buds, I do switch over to the predator bugs. Then I have a, an arrangement with the insectary. We basically set up a subscription service to where those bugs come every week, every two weeks as needed until I tell them that we have harvested, then they stop sending them. They just show up in a box that says live bugs. I just start putting them out as soon as they get there, build that population, keep those problem bugs away. Uh, those predators do need to be planned for. They need to be planned ahead. You do need to get them there. It's going to take you, if you're new with ordering from the insectary, it may take you two weeks to get your first batch. But after that, you'll be in the rotation. They may have to breed more bugs for you. Sometimes they're making the amount of bugs they sell. These people know what they're going to sell. They're making that amount. They got to step up their program to get you your order in two weeks. So be prepared. Also keep in mind delivery time. Also keep in mind somebody's got to disperse all of these bugs, which is cool because you can just do the whole room or you can really focus on problem hotspots. I've come to a part in my notes where it says PPE. We've already talked about personal protective equipment, but guess what? Once again, be safe in the grow. Protect yourself. Personal protective equipment, long sleeves, pants, shoes, goggles, respirator if you need it, gloves for sure, maybe even a Tyvek suit. Come on, protect yourself. All right, I just want to make sure that you're safe and that you go home to your kids or your dog or your turtle or all six of your cats or whatever you're doing. Take care of yourself.
Now, I did say that I was going to talk a little bit about some of the products that I use and do recommend. I've got a few disclaimers here, a bunch of rambling to do about this. First one, nobody pays me. I'm not paid by any fucking companies for any products. The only sponsors, the only people that are in my pocket, the only people whose pocket I am in, whichever way that goes, I do have an advertising agreement with seedsherenow.com. I'll be transparent with that. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you don't even get that ad. I can't put that ad on YouTube because YouTube doesn't agree with advertising for seedsherenow.com. If you're listening to the audio, there's a seedsherenow.com commercial at the beginning. That's the only advertising agreement I've got arranged. Nobody pays me, uh, nothing like that. So let's talk about the products that I do recommend. I talk a lot about Evergreen. Evergreen's a good product. It's a pyrethrin-based product. It works on a lot of pest, a lot of problems, a lot of pests. It doesn't do a lot of stress to the plants. That's a good product. Another product I recommend is Azamax. Another product I recommend is Azatrol. Something else I like a lot is Botanigard Max. Another product I'll recommend is Venerate. Uh, something else I really like is Monterey Garden Spray. Monterey Garden Spray has an ingredient in there called Spinosad, which is very effective against white flies. If you've got white flies, hit it with that Monterey Garden Spray. Uh, every three days for like three or four applications, your white flies will be gone. You can also do the soil dredge with the Monterey Garden Spray, get that spinosad in there, your white flies will disappear. The spinosad is a, a fungus, uh, a fungus is a bacteria or fungus. It's a fungus that grows on the bottom of whiskey barrels, and they've found that that kills white flies and many other insects. Other products that I really enjoy are cease. I use cease for powdery mildew. I also like regalia. I like double nickel. I like a product called B52. I really like a product called Zero Tall. It's good for a lot of things. You can clean with it. It'll help you get rid of powdery mildew. It creates that undesirable environment for your plants, and you can use it really late in the game. I'm not going to give you any time frames. Another product I really like is the Mammoth P uh, Pest. What's it called? I, I know the name of it. My brain won't say it. Anyway, the people that make Mammoth P, Mammoth makes a pest applica pesticide application. I know the name of it. My brain will not say it. Guys at Mammoth, I apologize. Your pesticide application is fucking great, and it smells wonderful, which I don't know. Is that a good thing? Because I'm in there going, this smells so good. I'm just sucking up the pesticide. That could be dangerous. But there's a Mammoth insect control product. My brain will not, I apologize because it's a good product, whatever. Whatever the name of that shit is, Google Mammoth insect, uh, Mammoth pesticide. It'll come up. Something I want to rec uh, one thing I want to recommend is do not use. I do not recommend using botanical oils. Um, you see them at all the grow stores, all the hydro stores. They're in pretty colored bottles. There's a purple one, a pink one. One's got lavender. One's got rosemary and shit in it. I do not like those. That flavor ends up in your buds and it doesn't taste good. Have you ever like tasted perfume? Like when a somebody sprays perfume or cologne in the room and you can taste it. That's what botanical oils taste like when you smoke the bud. That's what they taste like when you make concentrates. Don't put that shit in there, please. Also, I do not like neem oil at all. Get rid of that shit. Now, something I do need to touch on, being that I am certified by the Colorado Department of Agriculture to be, uh, let me explain my credentials here since we're in the middle of a fucking pesticide application podcast. My certification comes from the Colorado State University, also the Colorado Department of Agriculture. I took a class at the university, and I was given the license by the Colorado Department of Agriculture. I've got license number 17. I'm 017 in the Train the Trainer certification program. I was trained by a great person named Thea Walker. She gave a great class, good teacher, very personable person. Uh, so I am certified. I am train the trainer certified, which means I can go to a commercial grow, whether it's a farm, whether it's a weed grow, if it's tomatoes, if it's soy, and I can train the crew and the lead grower in safe pesticide management, application, handling, and education. I am certified by the a university and the Department of Ag to do this. I've got paperwork. So I am qualified to give this pesticide information. Something I want to touch on right now is all of the products I recommend, all of the methodology I've recommended is legal here in Colorado in a commercial grow. I think actually Azamax may have been banned recently, but most of the products I recommended are legal and safe here in the state of Colorado. I don't know where you are. I don't know the laws. We have to work with the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment the Colorado Department of Agriculture, and probably other entities that I'm not even aware of. 
They've got to approve every pesticide that we use on our products. So make sure that the products you are using are approved by your state regulators. I don't know what state you're in. I don't know what products you're using. Don't blame it on me. You've got to do that work. I'm telling you what I use, what I recommend. Don't let me ruin your license. Don't let me fuck up your plans. Don't get in trouble because of me. Also, I try in my personal grow to stick to those sta same standards that are held by the commercial grow. Um, sometimes I'm a little bit more strict, but also full disclosure, when I get new clones in, I spray it with shit that I will not even tell you because it's not going to be consumed. Uh, it's going to become a mother plant. It's going to get cloned out a bunch of times. And then 90% of what I grow is not consumed. It's turned into seeds. So people aren't smoking most of it. So that's a different argument right there. Uh, know those laws and rules. And I've got the word quarantine written down because that was something I already touched on, but I wanted to segue into it now. When you do get new clones, new plants, make sure you treat them so that they can be quarantined. Don't put them into general population. Keep them safe. All right, let me review my notes. Make sure we've covered everything. I talked about ways to make sure you don't get bugs into the room. I talked about preventative sprays. I've talked about preventative predatory bugs. I've talked about ways to eradicate those bugs if you do see them. If you do see bugs in your grow, it's time to step up your pest application. Keep in mind rotation and keep in mind bugs do build resistance. Also, multiple modes of attack. Understand how each pesticide works. Some pesticides make the bugs forget to eat. Some make them forget to breathe. Some pesticides grow a mushroom inside of the bug and the mushroom takes over the bug and they explode. Understand the method of attack. If you can get two modes of attack in a mixture, there's nothing wrong with spraying two pesticides at the same time on your plants if if you understand what's in both of those bottles. Some things you can't spray together. Some things will have negative reactions, but most of the time you can mix one, two, maybe even three pesticides together and blast the shit out of that crop. Maybe do a tester spray. Don't hit the whole crop at first, but you can mix things. All right, I think that does wrap up my integrated pest management episode. You guys have been asking for longer episodes. There you go. I'm actually tired from recording a podcast. I wore myself out doing this. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions, corrections, comments, or concerns, you know that I would love to hear from you. My email address is at hotmail.com. Don't be shy. Send me those questions, corrections, comments, concerns, constructive criticism, positive feedback. Let me know what you think of the show. I would love to hear from you. Also, if you feel like the show is educational, informative, or entertaining, maybe you'd just like to throw me a buck for helping you out. All you have to do is visit patreon.com forward slash grow from your heart. All of the information you need to support the show will be right there on the screen. Once again, big thank you to everybody for supporting the show. Any other info you may need will be on my website at iriegenetics.com. Don't forget about Irie Direct. There will be a 4th of July sale on Irie Direct. If you have not found it yet, go to my website, iriegenetics.com. There's a tab for Irie Direct. Click on there. Don't be discouraged if stock is low. I randomly update that whenever I've got some seeds available to put on there. It could be three in the morning. It could be two in the afternoon. You never know. Seeds may pop up on iRedirect. Stay tuned. Refresh often. Here's a hint. If you are a part of the Discord, the iRe Army Discord, if you go to any tab on the iRe Army Discord, uh, the general chat, any of the chat boxes, and you type in dollar sign iRedirect, it will respond with a real-time update of what is in stock on the website. It will give you a list. It'll say um, the machine is in stock, strawberry starburst in stock, the red pill, the blue pill in stock. It'll tell you what is there in real time. They do sell out quite quickly. So once you've got that notification, you got to get over there and buy the bad motherfuckers. But that is one way to cheat and get an update on stocks. So you don't have to click on every one of them and see if it's sold out or not. I apologize that the website does that. Also, there are a lot of kinks to building a new website. Thank you for being patient with me while we get I redirect ironed out. I appreciate it. Also, big up to the web guy. You guys, I'm rambling. Let's get the hell out of here. Uh, website, iregenetics.com. Check out I redirect. There's a 4th of July coming. New shit will be on there. More of the older shit will be on there. Most importantly, coupon codes and fat sales. Stay tuned. That shit's coming up real, real quick here. You guys, that is all I've got for this episode. I'm tired. My eyes are heavy. My throat's burning out. I give you a lot of great content. That is all I've got for you for this episode. You know I'll be back in a couple of days with fresh new content. I want to give a big shout out to my friend Lauren at LB Seed Company. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me.